Hi, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at GWIC Night this year. My name is Heather McGrath and I'm a research scientist at Natural Resources Canada and I'm happy to present to you today some of the latest flood mapping activities and research that we're doing at Natural Resources Canada. So just to give you a little outline of the talk for the next 30 minutes, uh, we're going to talk about some of the flood mapping activities at Natural Resources Canada, specifically at the Canada Centre for Mapping and Earth Observation, where I work. So we'll talk a little bit about the Federal Flood Mapping Guidelines series and where we are in that. We'll talk about the National Flood Hazard Data Layer, the work that we've been doing on foundational data layers that support flood mapping, as well as some research activities. Flooding is the temporary inundation by water of normally dry land, and it can occur in coastal and lake areas, along rivers, from stream blockages including ice jams, from failure of engineering works including dams, or extreme rainfall, rapid snow or ice melt, or other sources. Floods are commonly occurring natural hazards in Canada, and they account for the largest portion of disaster recovery costs on an annual basis. Flood mapping that accurately delineates flood hazards is the first step to increasing community resilience with regard to flooding and they are applied throughout the emergency management cycle. Flood maps vary across Canada and establishing a national approach to flood mapping will facilitate a common national best practice and increase the sharing and use of flood hazard information, thereby improving the foundation from which further mitigation efforts can be initiated. And current and accurate geospatial data are essential to the development of flood maps, with arguably the digital train model having the largest impact on flood mapping. Water management, including flood mapping, is the jurisdiction of provinces and territories in Canada. The provinces and territories have progressed with flood mapping within their jurisdictions, but significant data gaps remain, and many of the existing flood maps are currently out of date. Since the 1970s, there have been several successful flood mapping programs conducted as joint efforts between federal and provincial governments, including the Flood Damage Reduction Program and the National Disaster Mitigation Program, as well as two programs that are currently running, the First Nations ADAPT Program and the Emergency Management Strategy. So I'll talk a little bit about the role of Natural Resources Canada and flood mapping. We are presently working to strengthen partnerships and develop mechanisms to share flood hazard maps and new foundational geospatial data. We are actively collaborating with our other levels of government, including federal, provincial, territorial, as well as Indigenous organizations, municipalities, uh, academia and the private sector, as well as insurance industry and NGOs. We're leading the Federal Flood Mapping Committee as well, we're engaging Indigenous and provincial and territorial stakeholders on the development of the Federal Flood Mapping Guidelines series. Natural Resources Canada is actively collecting information in an effort to fully understand and share knowledge about the state of flood mapping in Canada in order to develop a long-term vision and strategy for flood mapping in Canada. As well, we provide near real-time flood mapping services for major flood events and increased satellite capacity through the RadarSat Constellation mission. And we're creating a national flood hazard data layer by compiling an inventory of existing flood maps from across Canada to build a more complete national picture of flood risk and better understand the remaining gaps. A technical working group on flood mapping was formed in 2015 and is comprised of key stakeholders from federal, provincial and territorial jurisdictions, as well as the private sector and academia. They have all contributed valuable input to the development of the Federal Flood Mapping Guidelines series documents. So what we see here is a representation of the initial kind of outline and framework of the documents that were being developed under this series. Over the past several years, while working with the stakeholders, we've applied some revisions to the initial framework diagram and added some documents to the series. So as we see here, the revised diagram considers these new documents as well as a new layout. 
the new documents include the land use guide for flood risk areas and flood damage estimation for buildings and infrastructure. There are 10 guidelines in the series, and there are several steps from the initial study to contracting and reports, establishing a technical working group with specific thematic knowledge, um, consultations, translation, review by the broader technical working group, and so on. So there's several steps in the process to have these published. We've got several published already um, in the version one, as well as we've got two that are in the version two release. And then a few that are in the final stages that should be out by the end of the fiscal year. Overall, across the 10 guidelines, we're at about a 78% completion. The Federal Flood Mapping Guidelines Series intends to inform consistent practices for flood mapping in Canada. And there's several words that we're keeping in mind as we're building them. We want them to be collaborative, so we're really interested in getting feedback from our stakeholders and users in order to make sure that these documents are collaborative documents. We want them to be able to be locally applied as well as adaptable for different scenarios or environments. We want them to be interoperable and be able to refer to different documents. We want the documents to be evergreen so that as new technology or new science comes about, we are able to update and revise these documents. As we saw in the previous slide, there were several documents that are in version two. We want the documents to be accessible and easily downloaded and read and, and applied. And finally, the flood mapping guideline series documents are voluntary. However, there has been some interest in developing these guidelines into standards. Recently, we held an engagement workshop around the idea of standardization of the guidelines to evaluate interest and support with regards to the idea of going through the process of standardization. This process of standardization will advance flood mapping at many scales, from the local scale to the regional to the national and international. As water does not respect jurisdictional boundaries, having a national standard will increase our ability for data sharing and interoperability within Canada and with other countries. In this next section, I'm going to talk about our work with the foundational geospatial data for flood mapping, as well as some projects related to flood maps. First available in 1997, the National Hydrographic Network focuses on providing a quality geometric description and a set of basic attributes describing Canada's inland surface waters. These features include lakes, reservoirs, watercourses such as rivers and streams, canals, islands, toponyms or geographical names, as well as constructions and obstacles related to surface waters. We continue to maintain and update all these components, including watersheds and transboundary watersheds, and working closely with the National Elevation Data Strategy Team to, among other things, improve the definitions of catchments. We're beginning work on the modernization of NHM. To build it in a model that's compatible with the Open Geospatial Consortium Standard of Surface Hydrology Features, or High Features, this new data model we're hoping will be more focused on analytical and service aspects, as well as being simpler and easier to maintain and update. We've begun a series of consultations with data users and data producers in order to get their feedback on what works in the NHN and what they would like to see added or changed. A total of five workshops were planned in order to better understand user needs and communities. And what we see here is just a series of logos from participants for some of these workshops that have already been completed. The first workshop was applications for cumulative effects monitoring and ecological assessment, where we had 70 participants. And our second workshop, we had representation from the Canadian Society for Hydrologic Sciences with over 100 registrations. And we've also got workshops planned for hydrographic networks versus toponymy, as well as groundwater and surface water coupling. A primary input to flood hazard mapping is a description of the terrain or a digital elevation model. We're currently modernizing our digital elevation model by developing a high resolution digital elevation model as part of the CAN Elevation series created in support to the National Elevation Strategy implemented by NRCAN. 
In the northern part of the country, we worked with Arctic nations in order to create a digital surface model with a resolution of about two meters. In the southern part of the country, south of the productive forest line, we're creating digital terrain surface models and other derived data sets from airborne LIDAR data. These are offered at a one or two meter resolution. We can see in the light green are the existing data available for LIDAR for download, and then in the dark green polygons are the data that we plan to release in the fall. All of these data sets are available from the link here, or you can search them in a web browser by HRDEM and NRCAN. Another project we're working on is a historic flood event database. And while there is the National Canadian Disaster Database, the records in it are limited to significant disaster events. And so the records in this Canadian Disaster Database, they need to conform to the Emergency Management Framework for Canada's definition, and they're subject to meeting a series of criteria. So it's not a fully comprehensive database, it's a database of significant disaster events. And so this lack of a complete and standardized historic flood database that documents all of the historic events that have happened in Canada is missing. And so presently this data is in uh, multiple databases, both public and private, and it contains a variety of different information and different levels of detail. This wide variety of data lacks consistency across platforms and has resulted in major information gaps. And as a result, Canadians are often unprepared and more vulnerable towards major flood events than they're aware. And so this historic flood database that we're compiling will contain a spatially accurate flood event layer and will provide insight into Canada's flood history and help Natural Resources Canada develop a flood risk information tool to discourage future development in vulnerable areas. This historic flood event database is going to be comprised of provincial, national, and open source data from the late 1600s to 2016. And at present, we have nearly 6,000 records compiled. So here is a snapshot of the database that we have so far looking at Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick. This is, again is comprised of open source data that we've been able to find, as well as information from the Canadian Disaster Database uh, kind of merged together. There is about 6,000 records, officially 5,780 at the moment, but that will be, uh, will be going up as we continue to append to this database. On the map, the lighter colored circle is the lower number of events, and as we have more events in a given area, we get a darker purple circle. And so we can see um, on the East Coast out in New Brunswick, this series of, of dark purple dots kind of outlines the St. John River, um, as well as we have a fair amount of flooding in Quebec along uh, the corridor from Montreal to Quebec City. We're really excited about this flood event layer. We think it'll be really informative. We're gonna continue working on this, filling in the rest of the records for Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick, as well as the rest of the provinces and territories to create a national historic flood event database. The timeline for this at the moment is to have this completed by the end of the year. So if all goes to plan, uh, hopefully we will have the, the database ready for, for viewing. In addition to the flood event layer, we're also creating a historic flood hazard data layer. So this flood hazard data layer is being generated from the maps from the Flood Damage Reduction Program, or the FDRP, which was an intergovernmental initiative that ran from the mid-1970s to the 1990s. And so we've gone through a process of taking these paper maps, digitized them, then went through georeferencing and vectorization of the flood zones in order to create a data layer of the flood zones. This data layer is comprised of close to 2,000 flood maps from 10 provinces and territories, and they have been digitized through three different contracts that ran from 2019 to 2020. This data is disseminated through the Federal Geospatial Platform, or the FGP. Once you access this data layer and you click on a specific neat line or polygon, you're provided with both a thumbnail preview as well as the corresponding metadata which you can download. 
This national catalog of existing flood hazard maps was created to promote sharing of flood risk information. They're all available in the FDRP at one centralized location, and you can search for a specific area of interest. The third flood-related data layer that we're building is a national flood hazard data layer of current authoritative flood hazard data sets. This work is driven by the emergency management strategy in direct support of the national risk profile and will be used to inform policy and emergency management. The National Flood Hazard Data Layer will incorporate geospatial flood data into one consistent database, including metadata, and will be stored and managed by NRCAN while actively maintained in collaboration with authoritative data providers in the jurisdictions. From this National Flood Hazard Data Layer, we aim to identify gaps in existing flood maps, for example, the age of the maps or areas with no maps, and be able to leverage this information for future priority planning with potential collaboration partnerships with the provinces for new mapping. So that brings me to my final section on flood mapping research and tools at NRCAN. So we'll talk a little bit about some projects that we have ongoing with academia, other government partners, and industry. We currently have several active project collaborations with academia, including projects with the University of New Brunswick, the University of Calgary, and the University of Waterloo, as well as graduate students working at Laval University and a contract with ENRS for some research related to drones and flood mapping. In addition to academic partners, we're also working with other levels of government. So we've been working with Statistics Canada on a socioeconomic dashboard for emergency preparedness and response. In this dashboard, we're leveraging the census data from Statistics Canada, looking at the 2016 census data and displaying information by census dissemination block about the type of population that lives within each of the blocks. So total population, looking at the distribution of age and household size, as well as the number of children and so on in order to get some information about the type of people living in these areas. As well, we're able to pull out information from the census about the type of buildings and dwellings that are in each of these census blocks. In addition to this rich data that we're able to get from the census, we're also displaying schools, which could act as shelter points, as well as communication towers for like cellular connectivity. We're also connecting to provincial databases that give information on road networks. So we're able to see if there are any road closures, which could help when planning evacuations. For the hazard, we're currently beta testing floods as well as fires that are available from the Canadian Fire Service. For the flood data layer, which is what we see in this map, this is developed by the Emergency Geomatic Service Group of NRCAN, or called EGS. This team is dedicated to the extraction of near real-time flood extents during major floods from SAR data, and they publish this data online in a variety of formats, including uh, WMS, as well as ESRI REST services, as well in shapefiles and KML. EGS produces several different flood layers. There is a active flood layer, which is floods in the last 72 hours. There is a current year layer as well, which is what we're seeing. So any flood events that have occurred in this case in 2020. EGS also produces products related to river ice. So we can look at river ice product footprints from the current year, as well as active monitoring of the river ice. We can also view the flood ice observation, which is a public data set that is derived by citizen science so that people have collected information about a flood and uploaded it to our service. And this is an interactive web tool. So users can pan and in and out and zoom in and out. They can search for a different community and zoom to that as well. They can also select dissemination blocks or select areas on the map. And the infographics along the bottom of the screen will dynamically update either based on the zoom extent or if you selected a series of parcels, it will update to reflect that selection information. 
We're currently getting feedback from our beta users in order to improve the dashboard for the, uh, the next spring flood events. Another project we're working on is the development of an open source flood mapping metadata portal. This is in collaboration with Conservation Ontario. Back in 2015, Conservation Ontario and Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry published a report of the metadata inventory of existing Conservation Authority flood mapping. This was based on data collected, voluntarily collected from the Conservation Authorities in Ontario and compiled into an Excel spreadsheet. There was many lessons learned from that 2015 project and those are accounted for in this new online portal that we are developing. As well, we're standardizing inputs, removing subjective fields, and the most significant change is in the addition of geospatial data. In this metadata portal, it is aiming to collect all of the underlying information that goes into creating a flood hazard map. So information about the study area, the length of river that is surveyed, the vintage of the elevation or imagery data, as well as details about the hydrology and hydraulics, the software, the models, the parameters that were used. So it's a very rich database of all the metadata that goes into flood hazard mapping. Authorized users are able to log into the system and enter all the information details about the study area, as well as upload a shapefile that either contains the neat line or the extent of the study area or the flood hazard polygon itself, and the system will be able to store either of those geometry or both. The second part of the tool is analytics or some reporting. So we've selected a number of attributes from the data entry fields in order to set up some reporting and we're gathering some feedback on those. So the first the user is able to just select a box on the map and query the data that's in that. So in this location, we've drawn a study area covering Southern Ontario and we can see the different types of uh, data sets and filters that we can apply, whether it's the project category, whether it's a hazard map, an inundation or awareness map, the type of record, the flood hazard standard that this is mapped to, whether there was financial support from different agencies, and you're able to query and view charts and maps about that data. The second way that you can visualize the data is by uploading a GeoJSON file of your specific study areas. In this case, we're looking at the Conservation Authority boundaries. And so users are able to generate heat maps, as we see here, colored by drainage area. And so we can see the different values of information that are there. Or we can also look at little pie charts that give information about the data that's been collected. And I just want to say that this is only test data in the database at this point. So what we see for information in this and the preceding slides are not representative of actual flood mapping. It's just a, a beta database that we've been entering some test data to give us some information and be able to populate these charts so we can get some idea of whether the scripts that we're running are functioning properly. We had a co-op student working with us from January to April in order to develop this prototype. And over the summer, we've had some CAs as well as some folks from Natural Resources Canada in Conservation Ontario doing some beta testing of this application and seeing how it functions. And we'll have another student coming in the fall to apply some of those updates and changes and hope to have this available as a metadata database for um, distribution by the end of the year. While this was test, while this has been developed and beta tested in Ontario, it could be applied and used in any region. The GeoJSON file that loads the geometry boundaries here, the Conservation Authority boundaries, that JSON file could be swapped out with your own specific geographic areas and all of the scripts would automatically point to the correct information. So we're hoping to see this as a potential portal that other users would be able to leverage as well for their flood hazard uh, metadata. 
What we see here is a poster that was presented at the Global Water Futures third annual virtual science meeting this year. Um, this is a collaboration between the University of Calgary and Natural Resources Canada, and this project is funded by the LMS Innovation Fund. So traditional mapping methods for flood hazard mapping, they focus on complex hydrodynamic and hydraulic models to simulate flows and map inundation extents. These models aren't really suitable for use in a near real time event during a flood to aid emergency management activities, and they have really heavy extensive data requirements. So we've done some research on this hand model, this height above near edge drainage model, which shows promise for being able to rapidly simulate flood extents. But what the hand model measures is the height above near edge drainage, and so that's in meters. But most of the river information, the flow information that is collected is in a discharge or meters cubed per second. And so this project is looking to create synthetic grading curves to derive a relationship between the height of the hand model and the river flow discharge measurements using Manning's equation. And so this poster was developed in order to kind of give some details about this project. We've got a study area here in Ottawa, just outside of Ottawa. Um, our primary inputs are a digital elevation model, the NHN data of rivers and watersheds and water bodies, as well as land use land cover, and then the derived hand model. And we use some GIS techniques in order to solve that Manning's equation. Our preliminary results are looking pretty good compared to, to non-synthetic rating curves, uh, so we're continuing to test this technique. And the last uh, research project I'll talk to you about is one that we are working on with the Geologic Survey of Canada and IBI Group. In this project, we're looking at flood risk modeling toolbox for Canada. Uh, at the moment called Can Flood. There's a beta version that we've been testing. It's an extension to QGIS that we are testing in order to see how it's able to evaluate risk, the outputs that are being developed, and we're working on um, additional criteria that we can include in the program and looking at different tools available for that. And to summarize, um, at NRCAN, we are working with data to share flood hazard maps and new foundational geospatial data, as well as flood history databases as well. We're creating this national flood hazard data layer by compiling an inventory of existing flood maps to build a more complete national picture of flood risk. We are engaging with our Indigenous as well as provincial and territorial stakeholders on the development of the Federal Flood Mapping Guidelines Series and developing a long-term vision and strategy for flood mapping in Canada. We also provide through the Emergency Geomatic Services Group near real-time mapping and services for major flood events through the increased capacity through radar sat constellation mission. And we've got some research projects that we're collaborating with academia, industry, and other governments. I would like to thank all my team members that helped contribute to this presentation and everybody here who joined us today. Uh, thank you very much. I welcome any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was a very, very wonderful presentation and I'm glad to see that uh, we already have some questions coming in. Uh, can you hear me all right, Heather? Yep, again. Wonderful, all right, so let's get the ball rolling. Our first question is from Sven Cohen. Will the historic flood DB be used by NRCAN to prioritize where the future HRDEM products will be acquired and created? Um, thanks, Ben. Uh, yeah, I think that's one of the one of the ideas is that we'll use that and add that to the criteria that they're already using to prioritize um, new HRDEM collections. So, yeah, um, that that will be one of its uses. Wonderful. Our next question is uh, from Richard, and just a thought, but maybe we can work together across borders. Certainly there's IJC for the St. Lawrence that uh, regulates water levels, but should we be doing a cross-border flood analysis group, methods that have worked in multiple areas? 
Um, yeah, absolutely, Richard. That's a that's a great thought, and I would love to to follow up with you after about this. I'm aware of a little bit of the work with the IGC, especially in the Richelieu and the Quebec U.S. or Canada U.S. border on the coast. Um, so I, I think that would be a great idea, and and would love to talk to you further about that because yeah, as was mentioned, water doesn't restrict uh, or doesn't know boundaries, so flows in the U.S. coming into Canada and vice versa, we certainly need to be aware of and be able to kind of um, make sure that those data sets are in agreement. Uh, we do have a comment as well as a question from Denis. So he says, thank you, Heather, for a very interesting and good presentation. Uh, his comment is, for your consideration, I would suggest that NHN should stand for National Hydrology or Hydrological Network rather than Hydrographic, as Hydrographic relates to charting the water depths and other elements of water bodies for the primary purpose of safe and efficient navigation and other uses. And his question following that is, are you open encouraging and leveraging local crowdsourced data flood mapping layers? If so, do you have a lot of crowdsourced data and how do you integrate it versus authoritative data? Um, I will start with the first one for the NHN. So as part of the engagement for the NHN, one of the questions that we have been asking in the working groups is what do you think the name for this should be? So whether it's NHNV2 or uh, we've had a, a few different ideas suggested, um, but you, you make a very good point and I will uh, I'll make sure I'll take that back to the, the organizers and the, and the group that is leading this uh, NHN kind of revision um, and, and bring that to their attention to, to make sure that they're aware and see if they apply that to their, their thought process for the new version. Wonderful. And then for part two, that was about crowdsourced data, sorry, was it? Uh, yes, would you like me to review the question? Yes, please. Wonderful. Uh, the question was, are you open, encouraging, and leveraging local crowdsourced data flood mapping layers? If so, do you have a lot of crowdsourced data and how do you integrate it versus authoritative data? Um, I can't speak too much to about that because I'm not too involved with the crowdsourcing. I, I, there is a, an application developed by Emergency Geomatic Service Group that allows people, I think just currently supported on Android, but allows users to register and collect and, and upload information from a flood or ice events. Um, I'm not sure the details of how the users are vetted and how on our side we kind of do a QC of that. Um, that's something I would need to follow up with you a little bit further because I'm not entirely sure how we are managing that to make sure that the data that we are receiving from CloudSource um, is, is vetted and verified before we, we post or share. Um, it's certainly used in, in my side and research um, in order to kind of validate some models in some ways, but for kind of national products, I'm not sure how that's integrated. Uh, so I could follow up with you after regarding that if you'd, uh, if you'd like to know more. Wonderful. Um, so, and Denis, if uh, this might be also a wonderful opportunity to touch base additionally via Slack um, and uh, kind of discuss that in further detail. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and then we also have a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, will there be another round of funding to do floodplain mapping? Um, that's a great question and I'm not really sure at the moment. Um, we had the NDMP program, the National Disaster Mitigation Program, that uh, just wrapped up. It went from 2015 to 2020, and there was, uh, there was a lot of uh, applications and a lot of work that went into that around floodplain mapping and communication and, and those four pillars. Um, I think we're still kind of getting all the results and in, in assessing that. So at the moment, I, I don't know if there will be another round. Uh, I think it's being discussed, but no decisions have been made. All right, wonderful. We have an additional question from Marco. Are you using or planning to use historical satellite imagery, SAR, uh, and optical to understand historical floods and map risks in remote areas? Uh, yeah, we actually, we have a, a researcher with the um, Canadian, CSRS group, a group of researchers that is looking at historical stacks of satellite imagery and being able to um, pull out whether pixels are water or not water and looking at that time series and getting probabilities of uh, whether areas are flooded or not. So we do have a couple people that are that are looking into that historical stack of satellite data in order to try to come up with uh, 
um, like a probability of flooding in that locate in that way. Um, and so that is, yeah, ongoing. I think some work has started in New Brunswick um, and he's starting to work across the country with that, that information, but it's too early to uh, kind of really speak on any results just yet. Wonderful. And so I'm assuming with that, that it's currently ongoing. Um, do you have any ideas as to how long that procedure will be taking and when the estimation of completion would be? Uh, that's a really good question, and I don't know offhand. I have been speaking with the researcher and kind of looked at some of his preliminary results. Um, and I think there's a, a paper published recently on some of the methods, but we haven't uh, gone to a na national scale of it. So unfortunately, I don't have a firm uh, deadline or date for that. That's, that's all right. Thank you very much. And uh, so I do encourage, since we do have a little bit of time remaining, anyone with any additional questions, please feel free to, uh, to enter them within our Q&A. And while individuals are typing, is there anything that you would like to add or um, add any final remarks to your talk? Um, yeah, I guess I can speak a little bit more to the, the question about flood risk. We're also looking at uh, ways, because we don't have, a, as was mentioned, several of these projects are to try to get a better understanding of what the flood maps are available, and then obviously what that risk is potentially to our citizens. So we do have a few other projects that weren't necessarily mentioned, um, how we're using different uh, hydrogeomorphological layers in order to kind of identify areas using national data sets that are maybe more susceptible or prone to flooding and looking to create a, maybe a, a flood risk layer from some of these databases that we're building. Um, Perfect. Uh, we had another question come in. Uh, I think there was a recent budget announcement regarding the renewal of NDMP for two years. Ah. So that is anonymous from an anonymous attendee. Okay, thank you. So that kind of overwrites my previous answer then about uh, extension of uh, the funding. So thank you. Perfect. And are wetlands and soil type considered in the flood risk modeling? Um, what we've been doing for, so for the, the flood hazard mapping, we're just kind of collecting what the local communities are using. So if they're incorporating wetlands, soil, climate change in their flood hazard maps, and that will kind of get carried over into our national flood hazard data layer. Um, in this kind of stack of satellite imagery, um, not specifically, I don't believe, because they're just looking at the return of the intensity of the pixels in order to find out a probability. Um, for this other project where we're looking at the hydrogeomorphological, we would be looking at wetlands and soil type um, and geology and, and factors like that while we're trying to, to model in areas that are more susceptible to flooding. Um, so it could get, get yeah, incorporated into our, our flood risk uh, simulation or predictions. Wonderful. And um, we do have a Question that's a bit of a clarification. Um, I missed part of it, so this may have been explained, but my question is, are you using building footprint data? And this is from Alessandro. Oh, uh, yeah, we do have a group at CCMEO that is um, taking this uh, data from the LIDAR and instead of extracting it from, sorry, they're taking the LIDAR data and in addition to getting digital elevation models, we're also using that LIDAR point cloud data to generate building footprints. Um, and so we are, we do have a separate initiative for a national building layer and creating building footprints from the LIDAR is one of the sources that's going to be for this building footprint layer. Um, and so we are generating um, a data layer that will have building footprint data that um, will in some way, like, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how you're asking about whether, how we're using the building footprint data. Um, but we do have an initiative in order to generate a building footprint data layer as well. We've had some outreach with different agencies that would want to use that building footprint layer to figure out what type of attributes would be best suited to store along with that in order to, to get the most users. Okay, thank you. And uh, we our next question is, can you please comment on any potential erosion hazards, risk mapping, uh, hazards or risk ma mapping that may be undertaken at the national level? Um, that's a great question, and I don't, I don't know. I'd have to ask around with some of my uh, fellow researchers and scientists and, and some of the other groups, because I, 
I'm not sure of what work has been done in that in that area. Okay. So I have to follow up on that. Wonderful. And um, we do have a question that has uh, come in via our chat. Can we use the data maps with students? Um, which maps um, are you asking about? So we'll give uh, Bettina a moment just to clarify. Um, and just uh, in continuation with the previous question from Alessandro, uh, he just wants to clarify that we have open data, uh, an open database of buildings at StatCan. It may be of interest to you. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, wonderful. All right. Uh, maybe to go back to the question about students, yeah. um, we do have um, a lot of the flood mapping data, uh, especially from the Emergency Geomatic Service Group, is posted on our Federal Geospatial Platform, or if you go to openmaps.ca, you can search for and use any information that's available there that's available to the public and is openly disseminated, uh, so that might be a, a great resource to, to look at. Wonderful. And that um, just, we received a little bit of clarification. So does that include the ArcGIS Living Atlas? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, if it's on the uh, FTP or open maps and you can search for it, then yes. <laughs> <Sorry. Yeah. laughs> um, and uh, we'll take this final question. Um, and just as a, a bit of an addition before the final question, we're receiving quite a few comments, uh, whether it be in the Q&A and the chat, uh, just really enjoying this presentation. Um, so thank you very, very much, Heather. It's an interesting topic. And in general, everyone seems to be really very interested. Uh, so we have our final question for this session. Could you expand on any sites, if any, where mitigation measures may have been noted, where historic flood occurrences may have been mitigated and how have uh, and now have less impacts? Um, that's a great question. The, the database is still being compiled, so there hasn't really been any real analysis on, on mitigation measures at the moment. Um, I know here in the Ottawa Gatineau region, last year there was some flooding in, in Gatineau um, and there was some uh, provincial policy about kind of buyback uh, properties and kind of rehoming re people or, um, yeah, not moving back into the same properties. Um, but uh, on, a, on a national level, I'm not really sure, but different uh, provinces and cities have been implementing different measures, but I don't have a, a clear clear answer for that. Okay, wonderful. So thank you again very, very much for uh, for the talk and thank you everybody who submitted some questions. I will be inserting within our chat right now the link to our Slack channel. So I do recommend that everybody utilize that platform in order to continue this conversation, uh, share some thoughts, uh, additional questions, etc. So thank you again, Heather, this was wonderful. And if everybody would like to join us following the break for the session in the other room, which is in Zoom Room 1, and that is the talk uh, from Nicholas Collette, the founder and CEO of Deploy Solutions, on New Horizons and Space Apps Development. So thank you very, very much, and we will see you all shortly. Thank you.